Hello, and welcome to the People Who Read People podcast. I'm Zachary Elwood. This is a podcast aimed at better understanding other people and better understanding ourselves. You can learn more about it at peoplewhoreadpeople.com. What you're watching now is a second part of a talk I had with Yakov Hirsch in late November of 2023. I separated that talk into three parts. The first one was focused on the Middle East conflict and anti-Semitism, and I've already shared that episode. The one you're watching now is about Trump and American polarization. In this talk, we mostly focus on Trump and his high animosity relationship with the media and the divergent polarized views that Americans can have of Trump. If you're listening to this on audio, just note that this was a talk Yakov and I had on video. So if you wanna watch the video, head over to my YouTube channel. That will also help explain why it seems more, a bit more rough and informal than usual. I didn't edit our talk as I usually do for the audio episodes. As you'll see, Yakov is someone like myself who tries his best to get into the heads of other people to understand what the reasons are for their actions. He attempts to have empathy for them, and he's committed to doing this even for people he very much disagrees with, or even for people he thinks are doing harm and are dangerous. This is a similar, this is a similar underlying thread in both Yakov and I's work. The idea that you can try to understand the more rational and understandable and human reasons for people's behaviors, even while thinking they're very wrong. And I think for many people, there can be a perception that trying to reach those understandings and having an empathy is naivete and weakness. Whereas I see doing such things as a great strength. When you try to do such things, you'll be less likely to amplify a conflict and make it worse. And I think taking such approaches Plus, obviously, makes it more likely you'll actually be able to achieve your own goals. And this talk may be a challenging one for some people. There can be a feeling like you're asking me to try to have empathy for Trump. He's nuts and dangerous. And I get that. It's a challenging thing for me, too. I sometimes have those feelings, too. It's like, am I being the sucker here? But I think there's something very important in that difficulty. All around us, we can see how conflict grows worse by people giving up on understanding other people's narratives and views. They write those people off, they see them as objects or as evil. People cease to care how their own actions and ways of speaking can help drive other people's aggressive and divisive behaviors. For example, in this specific case, it's important to see how aggressive and biased responses to Trump and Trump voters are a big part of what drives support for Trump. If we want things to get better, we must be willing to try to understand other people even when that's painful and challenging, and even when it makes us feel kind of gross inside. If you'd like to learn more about the American polarization problem, you might check out my book, Diffusing American Anger. You can learn more about that at American-Anger.com, or you can sign up for my Substack newsletter about polarization. You can find that link, uh, a link to that on my site, also at American-Anger.com. I also have a excerpt from my book, Diffusing American Anger, on there that's specifically about our distorted and polarized perceptions of Trump. You can find that in the book excerpt section on the site. Okay, here's the talk with Yakov Hirsch. Note that this video starts out with Yakov and I in the middle of talking about the Middle East conflict, and that's because this is the second part of the talk we had leading into the uh, us talking about Trump. You have to think of Israel's perspective because all what happened to them is the most terrible thing that can happen to a country. If it happens to any other country, they would do the same thing as Israel. But here's the issue. They they are living every day with the story whereas the rest of the world. They saw the story and most people said, oh my God, that's so horrible. But at some point, they're on to the new story. And the new story is every day, you know, innocents dying and Israel saying, doing what they're doing. Meanwhile, in Israel, when they look at their world, they say, don't you, don't, didn't you see what happened to us? Right. That's why Barry Weiss said at some point, these people are celebrating Jewish death. Right. Anyone who's demonstrating against the against the war is celebrating Jewish death. Don't you remember what happened to us? Right. That you don't empathize with what happened to us. Right. And the and the whole narrative that they have, their whole ideology. If you don't if you don't if you don't agree their ideology is the real world, that makes you on the side of Hamas. Mm. Right. So that's our situation, and and everyone chooses to fight it differently. Yeah, I mean, you have all these depolarization things, right? 
but look what you're up against. People who are, have ideologies are, and they're saying it's political science. They're not saying this is my politics. They're saying this is the truth about the world and more evidence and more evidence and more evidence. Right? Well, yeah, that's a, and that's a, maybe that's a good point to segue because yeah, the more, the more I've looked into the uh, liberal academic work around like, you know, the, the, the claims of high amounts of, of racism amongst conservatives and Trump voters like that. A lot of that work is just so weak to me. And, uh, you know, I'm not the only person that says that, like um, Musa Al Garbi academic it wrote a great paper called race and the race for the white house uh, that, that examined just some of the really bad and, you know, frankly, just kind of amazingly bad to me, academic work that was used to take the worst possible framing of what these this data says about what the you know what what conservatives and what Trump voters believe, and I was kind of you know I, I was actually kind of astounded because those are the things that were used to then paint this picture. They they were like the foundation of like what journalists would point to to frame or pundits would point to or politicians, Democrat politicians would point to to build their case of like these is this is the horrible white supremacy white supremacists and bigots that we're up against, you know, it, it's, it was almost just like taken as a, as a, as a fact in, in, in some quarters and in some in very influential quarters that, that all, that these things were true, but then you go look at the data that, that the things are built on and it's just such bad uh, academic work. And uh, you know, for example, like the one, the book that got a lot of uh, attention was uh, strangers in their, in their own land, which was kind of the sociological examination of Louisiana Trump voters or conservatives in general, but it just, you know, as, as Musa Al Garbi pointed out in his, in his work, people held this up as like saying a lot of, of, you know, significant things about conservatives in general, whereas like, actually it was just examining a few people in like the most deep red place in America. So of course you're going to find, find like the more extreme kind of narratives there. And then even within that, it seemed like uh, the author uh, Hothschild, I think was the name, uh, was taking like the most pessimistic interpretations, even within that framing. So just to say, like, but these are these are the these are the pieces of of work, books, or or academic work that are used to build this narrative that like these people are you know basically evil, you know, in a, in a similar way that I would say that happens, you know, in in other conflicts or or happens with you know Palestinians or you know. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but yes. I mean, this is, again, it's ideology. This, quote, academic, right, is an ideologue, meaning that he has this idea and he could muster whatever evidence he wants, and then he writes this thing. And this web, and the people with this ideology of that whites are racist, right, you just keep on accumulating to people who are receptive for whatever victimhood, whatever it is, for whatever reason that you're receptive to this, you are massing this data, and okay, everyone's like, yeah, of course. It's it's like it's 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 obvious already, right? It's obvious. Mm -hmm. Now, the, think about the people who who do the depolarization work. What do they do? They bring people, human beings, together. Ideologies are about ideas. Ideology says you see those people. This is what they believe, right? Depolarization is you put people together, and they're like, oh, you have twins too. Oh my God, I have twins. What? Is it's human beings, right? They're not ideological. But these people are telling you, no, everyone's ideological. All the white people out there, you know, each side is saying the other side is the one that's ideological. Mm -hmm. But basically, everyone is less ideolo ideological than the people who are, who are saying. Right, they're, exactly. They're yeah. the ones who are, who are ideological, not the people they're talking about. The uh, Yeah, and what comes to mind there, I, I actually wanted to write a piece about this, about the uh, the the really, you know, the, the complex narratives that people on both sides of the American uh, polarization, the, the the complex pessimistic narratives that people build. Like, so for example, you have Christopher Rufo who built, the, you know, he wrote this book about the the creeping uh, malicious uh, Marxism and uh, that 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 was on the left. You know, it, it, he painted this portrait of like all this stuff comes from these very bad people back in the day, and it's all just like this narrative, and it's that that's come forward into our time. You know, in, in the same way that. People do with, uh, you know, that the li some liberals do with uh, the more pessimistic uh, white supremacist framings. But 
you know, he's, he's built Rufo and other people are building this narrative of like those people that you, you, that you see who have those beliefs on the college campuses are, you know, deep in their heart, they want to destroy tradition and they, they want to create this, you know, Marxist wonderland or whatever, whatever he says, I haven't read his book, but I just read the, the summaries, but it's, it's the same kind of like trying to reach for this, like most pessimistic, uh you know narrative about who these these people the, this other side is you know and and then that's just the nature of what conflict does to people it makes us you know it makes us uncurious it makes us un, 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 un empathetic and makes us filter for the the reality that we want to see about the other side and yeah now think of bernie sanders when he ran in 2016 bernie sanders this is very interesting because bernie sanders is not ideological Right. He doesn't go there giving speeches about this side. No, he's saying we're all the people are in this together. Right. Your pri your problem. You have nothing to do with this person across the country, but you're both American and we should cut tack, you know, whatever, whatever his solution is. He wasn't ideological. And this someone like him is the solution. Some magnetic politician, because. If you look at the people who try to destroy Bernie Sanders, I'm not talking. I'm talking about the idea people. The people who are the most ideological and need these ideological battles, right? This is this is how people from conservatives got into Fox, got into MSNBC because they're very good at waging ideological war, right? They wait, and if you look at those people, look at what they wrote about Bernie Sanders, the venom, the hatred. It's because he's not fighting the the fight that they think needs to be fought, right? He right. right so so. So these ideas are very, very important when you're trying to make sense of politics. Yeah. And interestingly, from, you know, the depolarization angle too, a point I often bring up is it, it, a lot of liberals don't know that Bernie Sanders was very anti-immigration for most of his career up until recently. You know, he he called uh, illegal immigration, like lax immigration laws, a Koch brothers scheme because he thought these were ways, you know, using cheap labor were ways that people with money got more money. And uh, a lot of liberals don't know that, but I, I like to reference it as like as an argument to say, like, well, you presumably don't think Bernie Sanders is racist, racist for his, you know, he, he has a very liberal uh, background for his, you know, uh, for his stances on immigration. Uh, so and I like to make that point to say, well, if you can see how that doesn't require racism to have those views, maybe you can be a little bit more empathetic to, you know, the conservatives who have, have those views. But uh, just I want to. Yeah. This is just, just again, you look no hate. Right. Think about that. Every politician, but Biden's talking about hate. It's hate, hate, hate. Every politician is hate. Bernie Sanders, no hate. Right? No, I really I do really like him. The more I've I've, I've read about him and learned about him. Um yeah. I like his I like his approach and his way of, you know, disagreeing with people, basically. Um uh, so uh, yeah, maybe we can switch to uh the uh Trump himself. Uh, because one of the things I want to talk to you about, the main things, was your thoughts, you know, basically uh, having cognitive empathy for Trump, even as, you know, I'll give the usual disclaimer, like I think he's a very uh, narcissistic and dangerous person in his narcissism. And I've thought that since I read an early book, Trump, which was about his Atlantic City days written by a high level casino executive that showcased, you know, Trump's personality flaws being present way back in the in the eighties and being responsible for his Atlantic city casino failures. But all that said, like, I think he's very, very bad, very narcissistic, but I, I also agree with some of the things you and I have talked about, which was, you know, there, there are, there are some real understandable reasons for why tr Trump behaved as he did, including, you know, seeing legitimate, having legitimate grievances how, with how the media treated him and maybe you can talk a little bit about about that yes in, in february 2017 trump gave gave a news conference which i believe any historian who wants to really understand what happened here if they were to watch that news conference it would be eye-opening because in this news conference trump was totally authentic was being himself and if you're able to get by the judging right if you're able to look at trump and be a political quote a political scientist, but if you could imagine have a cognitive imagine being Trump, right? To really understand what's happening, a journalist their job should be to look at that and say, oh, this is what Trump thinks. This is what Trump feels about that. He got all worked up when he was talking about that. So people understand what's going on in Trump's head. The, but the audience 
That's not, that wasn't, they don't even think their job was that. Their job was to condemn, was to say how awful he was, right? So it's just the whole media attitude towards Trump, whatever he is, right? We're, we're not judging, right? Whatever, he could be the worst person in the world. We're trying to understand. So this news conference is so easy to see what Trump is saying. We're getting his opinion. And when you listen to his opinion, and that's what we both, when we both saw this, it was like, or Trump, knows there's nothing to Russia. He you just look at him and he just like, Russia. It's a, it's so obvious that this he's telling the quote truth, right? And anyone who even we've all we've all become so ideological that when you look at Trump, you can't even it's just like Trump, I hate you can't even think of his perspective, right? But then you understand the whole world. How much money did we just so if we could see that that image, right? He says yeah. it's a fire. Yeah, anyhow. Yeah, yeah. I want to. I want to play a few minutes of that because I mean, you you drawing my attention to that. Like, I, I had honestly not much. I had not watched much long form press conferences. You know, most of my awareness of that was in short forms. But you you got me to watch most of this, and which is like a pretty long thing. It was like an hour and a half or something. And you know, some of the things that stood out to me were, you know, a I have you know I've written about the the bad and irresponsible. Uh, press coverage of the Trump Russia stuff, you know, and, and people who are curious about that, I'll, I'll put links, uh, you know, in the, in the description for this, but, you know, there's, there's many even progressive people that have written about uh, the, the pretty, you know, quite bad uh, press coverage and, and the way politicians spoke about, you know, as if it was like a certainty that, you know, Trump included with Russia and these kinds of things. Uh, and Glenn Greenwald wrote a, wrote a good article, no matter what you think of Glenn Re Greenwald, I'm not a big fan because I find him very polarizing, but he had written a really good uh, uh, examination of like just really bad Trump Russia mainstream press uh, coverage. So you drawing my attention to this press conference, which I agree it was it was very interesting. A quick note here: I was initially thinking of adding in some footage from the 2017 press conference that we were referencing here, but instead I'm just going to include some links to that video in the entry for this episode on my site, PeopleWhoReadPeople.com. I think Yakov is right in that that was one of the more interesting press conferences from Trump's administration and seeing how he talked about the Trump-Russia coverage and understanding his relationship with the media. Okay, back to the talk. Uh, things that stood out to me were he was much more eloquent than I remember him being, but I think that, and I think part of that is, you know, my, my perception of that whole relationship, him with the press or him with, you know, liberals in general was that he became increasingly, you know, mad, like both angry and, and kind of, you know, maddened, I think, too, by, you know, the, the interaction. Like the, it was like a mutually amplifying, rage amplifying relationship, I felt like, because as you say, like, you know, uh, Matt Taby wrote a whole uh, wrote a book, Hate Inc., which examined some of like the liberal inclination to push back on you know, they were like, we're not going to, we're not going to take this. We got to be even more aggressive with our approach. You know, we, that was our failure or something. Uh, but, you know, this kind of like mutual, uh, mutual, mutual kind of radicalization, you know, uh, that, that struck me because he, he did, as you say, he struck me as, you know, even with some of the insults he would throw in, he, he struck me as somebody trying to reach out to them and say, look, you're being very unfair to me. Like if you did a better job, I, I would says, be your says, biggest fans. He says, I won. You know, yeah, just, and... like, let's not fight. I just want to bring up one of the think of, we're trying to think about what he said. He said Hillary got questions before one of the debates. Right. And he said he told the, he the press, can you imagine if I would have gotten questions before the debate? Right. If let's say it turned out Trump got somehow some guy at some guy at the gave him what the result. And as he and think about how he sees the world, nothing happened. It wasn't even a story. Right. So when he presents that, he doesn't get an answer, right? It is true. He's right about. So he keeps on making this argument to show that his view of the world is the accurate one. And it is. A lot of the things he says is accurate. Yeah, so, what you, you know, it is, under, so, it is understandable like that. And I think it's very important to see you know, that. Because, you can't yeah, understand Trump. Sorry, you can't understand Trump without understanding all of the things he knows to be true, which he knows it's a, you really have to, and now we have a very different Trump from the one that's 2016. That's a very big problem. Right. He's, he's gone, you know, he's gone down this, this path, which I think, you know, to your point, it's like, you have to be willing to examine like how he went down that path, you know, like it's important to understand that too. And, 
I think, you know, what, what the us versus them feelings or narratives do to us is like, I mean, you talk about this stuff to some liberal people, they just have no curiosity about any of that aspect, right? It's just like, we know he's bad. We know his Trump, his, the, the voters are dangerous. We know January 6th happened. We're not, we're not curious about like this interplay, the, the, the relationship of how, how these things play out, right? I mean, that's really the, it's really the lack of curiosity about the, the dynamics that, that, that get me. So, yeah. so if we're trying to understand truth, right, we will go to the, again, we would go to the Trump voter and we'd interview all of them. What do you like? How about he's on trial? What do you think of that? And we would be able to come up with an explanation. These, this, these are the main reasons why Trump voters still like Trump, right? And what I believe is it would be very different from the people who are saying this is what they believe. Yeah. And we have to, just from what we're speaking about here, imagine those Trump voters who are watching that video, which we both watched, and they're like, yeah, look, he, you know, he's making sense. He doesn't look, it's the media. Everything Trump says is, quote, true, right? And they're not even responding. And as we both know, there's some Columbia Journalism, a review, this big project, which was an ex New York Times journalist who wrote the, I forget what it's called, the media, the war against the, the war against Trump, which compiles all the this misinformation. So this happened in the real world, and you didn't have big discussions in magazines. Let's talk about they ignored it. Mm -hmm. So what does this mean? The media is playing politics, but they're claiming their political science. In other words, they're talking to a Trump voter. How could you vote for someone? You know, these moral arguments, right? So, but no, you're political. You have your own reasons, whatever it is, you're not objective. And they see that. So of course, it's totally understandable. I'd be like, yeah, I don't care. I'm, I'm, of course I'm on Trump's side in this fight. Yeah, exactly. I think that that's, that's the really important thing. Like in conflict, the, the, such an important thing is understanding how mu so much of like support for Trump or, su or support in, for somebody in a, you know, leader in a conflict is about your anger at the other side it's not even necessary it's not necessarily or not even often probably about really liking that person it's more like that person represents the fight against what you dislike on the other side and in the case of you know the the pretty bad uh the pretty bad coverage and framings and punditry around you know trump's trump russia stuff or you know trump's racism or or his vo his voters racism like all that stuff is sufficient to me to understand what bothers people like you could you can understand the animosity to me just based on those things like examining those things and seeing you know why people are so angry but uh i did and for people curious about this i will include like a lot of resources including like resources by you know uh people progressives or or people that are are not fans of trump like they were very much scared of trump but who have examined uh these issues but i think for a lot of people that's hard to they don't they, they don't really let want me, to see those let things. me give you an example of the right way to cover trump the responsible way that which should have been done in 2016 at some point trump said he was i forgot what court case it was on it, it was it was a mexican judge and he said that mex that mexican judge can't be honest or something like that it's, it's going to be biased now if you want to make a case against trump if you want to make a case to the american people you say hey we can't, don't you understand that we can't have a president who says this person is not fair because of the race? Imagine everyone listening to him, they go to court, they don't like the, it's like, no, he believes that because of, so no matter what we think of Trump, we cannot have a president who says this judge is not fair because he's a Mexican, right? Mm -hmm. That should be enough, whoever the opposition is to this president, this is what, you know, we, it's just that eliminates them. Yeah. There's plenty of there's plenty of legitimate things to focus on without taking the worst possible interpretation of everything. Making, yeah. It's just making fun of ridiculing him. I mean, it's yeah. just absurd what's happening. Or like, yeah, him him telling, you know, the, the things like him telling Congress people born in this country to go back to their countries. And like, that's objectively bad. We don't need to reach for all these other, you know, uh, interpretations. Right. Um, uh, yeah. So I think, uh, you know, maybe. Uh, Maybe I'll just put in the uh, a video clip of the of the Trump conference later, just so people can you know see a little bit of it. I don't think we need to play it, uh, but I'll just I'll just yeah. play a little bit. And if people are interested, they can go watch more. Uh, so yeah, we can we can skip that. But um, let's see. Let me look at my notes here. So this is, I mean, so think, I mean, think about what we're facing, the challenge we're facing. 
on the one side, the quote media, the establishment, however you want to call them, right? Washington, New York, whatever. I don't know the right words. They have, they see Trump is being put on trial. He's the most popular. It looks like he's going to be the nominee, right? And all of these people believe that they, that this is the end of democracy. And therefore their reporting, their takes yeah. on everything is it's the end of democracy okay. and the other side and Trump's going to be, then he's going to be taunting the media. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm going to do when I become president? I'm going to put you all in jail. <laughs> just, just ramps right? up just, more and more. Yeah. Just, yeah. So, so, you know, there's no, they're, like I said, they're experiencing the world in different ways. And who's, and who's the, who's supposed to be the responsible one? The media is supposed to be the responsible one. Instead, they're more ideological than Trump. That's the secret. In 2016, Trump didn't come here, White Nash. He was not ideological. You know, when you listen to him, when he got to work, he really wanted to, quote, make America great, right? He gave, he was proud. If you look at his interaction, think about it. every day he'd go to work, he'd get things done. He'd turn on, he'd go home, he'd go up, he'd go to his bedroom, he'd turn on the CNN. he would be like, no, that's not what happened. That's a lie, right? And he'd throw the remote at the TV. Yeah. Well, yeah. Speaking sure. of speaking of worst case interpretations, like the whole thing about like interpreting make America great again slogan as like an obviously racist slogan. When like when you look into that history, it's like both Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton used it at least once in, in some of their campaigns. Like there, you know, there's examples of that. And like it's a very easy to understand slogan because, you know, you most people would interpret it or you know, I think most Trump voters are interpreting it as like, there was a time when we had many more jobs and the main, you know, the main streets weren't decimated and small towns weren't decimated. You know, it's like, but to reach for this like ultra pessimistic interpretation of like, oh, they're, they're just, they, they just want a time when white people had more control. I mean, as that's the soon, very pessimistic. As, as soon as this became the approach to Trump in 2016 by the media, what we have now what became inevitable, inevitable, because you have each side interpreting the way differently and it keeps that, and here we are. Right? The very nature of conflict, yeah, just it, it, it ramp it ramps up insults lead to insults, threats lead perceived threats. So it's lead things to you believe threats. about the, that's the thing. It's they each side becomes more ideological. They keep on collecting more things that they're right. Right, about. right. Where yeah, that, that's what led to things like you know clear people writing as if the January sixth event was a white supremacist uh, event. When you know it's like the people would write about it as if. It was clearly, evidently, just about a white supremacist overthrow of the government. When, like, that there were, you know, you can look at the pictures of the people there. There, there's clearly like a, a significant number of minority, racial minority Trump voters, and all it takes to be at that event is a belief that your the election is being stolen. It does, you know, if you, and if you, and if the president's telling you the election is stolen, a lot of people are going to believe that, right? It's like it's it, it doesn't require it's any more. January 6th is a perfect example because there's a fight about meaning. What does the, this event mean, right? And it, and one side tells you what it means. And they didn't stop telling you what it means, right? But I don't think political science, right, if they were to interview every person and find what, why you, you would want to hurt anyone, we'd come back, the report they'd come back with is very different from the reporters. The media. In fact, you know, Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic, he he spoke to someone on that march and he voted and he and he and what did this person tell him what did he quote he said this person said the worst white nationalist things imaginable that's the thing right these people ideologues this is to help their interpretation so it's a it's a big problem mm -hmm. right to mm -hmm. understand reality we live in a big country that's what i often emphasize it's like you know we have 330 million people in this country like you can't just pick out pieces of information and like build a simplistic narrative in such a complex world, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, I, okay. So, oh yeah. Getting back to like one thing you and I had talked about was both you and I had a, had a, an early read in, in like 2000, you know, 17 that the Trump Russia stuff wasn't going to amount to stuff. And I didn't go on record on that, but it was something that was early in my mind. And it was based on uh, the fact that, you know, kind of, kind of related to uh, the, the poker tell stuff where, uh, you know, a common one of the most reliable tells in poker is when somebody if somebody's making a big bet and they're just like very, you know, very relaxed and don't have anything to, you know, they're, they're just very effusive and, and very, you know, are willing to talk about the hand like they're willing to talk about what they have. You know, those are all really good signs that they're relaxed and are, are, are value betting. They, they're not bluffing. Right. So in a similar way, like not to say that this is 100 percent or anything, but when I perceived when I saw Trump talking about the Trump Russia stuff in such a 
effusive way and just, you know, went on for long stretches of time about it. Uh, he even like, even like him, uh, you know, saying that thing of uh, in 2016 before he was elected, where he's like, you know, kind of kidding around thing where he's like, Russia, he's if, you, if you have, if you have those Hillary the Clinton idea. emails, you know, if you have those Hillary Clinton emails, I think he initially said like uh, Russia, China, anybody, if you have the, uh, the emails, send them, you know, send them to me kind of in a mocking way. And then he later, he repeated like, uh, Russia, if you have them, I'd, I'd like to get them. You know, th that, that read to me, like the, the other behaviors is like, this is not a guy who's like trying to hide associations with Russia. Cause I, you know, no matter, even if you think Trump's a lunatic, like it, it just would be very unusual in my opinion for somebody to be, have be completely relaxed, you know, talking about Russia and including in the press conference that, uh, you know, uh, we were referencing earlier, he was just very, just seemed very genuine to me about like talking about Russia, talking about like, Hey, I have no involvement over there. I own no businesses like blah, blah, blah. And it's like, uh, my read was just like, I don't think, you know, when people would talk about, Oh, this Trump Russia thing is going to expose so many things. I was like, I, I really don't think that's going to happen. Like, sure. Maybe yeah, I could be wrong. Obviously these things aren't foolproof, but that was my read of the, of the situation. Yeah. The question is, what is he that what we're curious about? What is he thinking? What was he thinking when we said that? And if you just open your eyes, you see he's thinking it's a you know, he's making a joke, he's ridiculing the whole thing. That's all we need to know. You can't have a take, no, we sending message. No, you just look at him. For instance, I'll give a, an example that the audience should understand. When a, an interrogation, when police interrogate suspects, right? If you have 20 years of interrogation, Right. And if you a woman gets killed and you bring the husband in, right, and you start asking the husband questions, right? If the husband acts a certain way when you ask him where he was that morning, he starts going off for 20 minutes. Oh, I went there and stopped and it was 7 Eleven, right? They know from experience people who do that, that well, it's 98.7% guilty because a normal person, they're like, why? You think I did it? Right. You think I, all of that. Right, so right, that right. Is, so think about that as a tell. If you're paying attention, you say, no, this person wouldn't do that if this was the case. So right. poker, when you're sitting and playing you know, hundreds of hours and you see the same thing over and over and over, you can't help but say, oh, when someone does that, it means that. Now, of yeah. course, you have to correct. It's, you know, it doesn't. Anyhow. Yeah, no, a great, a great example of that was like, you know, these are all just anecdotal, but, you know, the, the real power is in the the patterns of them, but like the Chris Watts, uh, you know, he, he killed his wife and children and he watched that footage of him interacting with the cops and he's just like really cagey and like, doesn't say much because he's afraid of, you know, how can my words be interpreted, you know, but somebody who doesn't, isn't afraid of being caught in anything or just they'll, they'll talk about anything. And, you know, people have disagreed with me about this. Like I had someone I know write to me and say, but Trump's a sociopath. He's an extreme narcissist. Like, you can't take those normal things. And I'm like, I, I think you can actually, because it wasn't like maybe if Trump was already like, you know, charged in a court of law or something and had nothing to lose, he would behave abnormally. But everybody has something to lose. Like, you know, you, that's the nature of bluffing, too. It's like you have something to lose. So it kind of forces, you know, it, it, it kind of exerts an influence to act in certain ways. So, you know, if, if Trump had been colluding with Russia, it's pretty unlikely to me that he would be able to speak so freely about these things because he had to be worrying about like, well, how are people going to interpret this? What are they going to find? What information are they going to find? And, and how I word this, you know, but the fact that he just spoke so loosely and like the fact that some people like with him doing the thing about like, hey, Russia, if you have Hillary Clinton's emails, like some people interpret that as like he's making a message to them. Like if you were colluding with Russia, you wouldn't have to put it on live TV for everyone to see. That'd be the last thing you would want to do if you were colluding with Russia, because you'd be like, you wouldn't want to draw attention to the fact that you were colluding with Russia, right? Like you would do it with a back channel. You would, it just, to me, it was like the complete opposite uh, of what people were like filtering it through their like lens of like, how can I make this fit my view of Trump, my, my extremely negative view of Trump? Here's, here's the secret. Trump is transparent. Every other president you ever interviewed, you didn't know what they were thinking. Basically, if you understand, if you pay attention, Trump is transparent. Just look at him and he tells you what's it's going on. It's very much right? surface. It is very yeah. uh, much surface. I mean, another example of that, you know, and I, 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 for people interested in this, I, I have a whole chapter in my book where I go through the extremely pessimistic interpretations of, of things that are top of people's mind for the horrible things Trump has said, like Mexicans rape this thing. Or, uh, you know, the other example was like in one of the debates uh, he with... Uh, 
uh, with Biden, he said something like, you know, uh, they were like, what do you think of the Proud Boys? And he was like, Proud Boys, stand, you know, stand by or stand, stand back, down, or stand whatever. by. But, you know, to me, I, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time interpreting people's language. I wrote a whole book on verbal poker tells. Uh, to me, that stood out as like, no, he was basically just trying to not give points t- to uh, people who wanted to paint Proud Boys as like a significant problem. And he's basically telling, trying to say, Proud Boys, let the police do their work. Like he was basically trying to, the more important part of his statement was stand back or whatever. And then he just said, stand by. But people interpret that as like, as if he was sending some military command to them. And I'm like, that is, that's like the most pessimistic way to interpret what happened. Like as if, as if Trump is like some great communicator that he planned ahead to, to send this secret message to these people when like, we know he just speaks off the cuff and speaks really think about loosely. What he, think about what he said. I am the least racist and anti-Semitic person in the world, Right. So he said those things. Now, let's imagine what he, what did Trump mean when he said that? In his mind, you know, there's this African-American who brings his car in a certain time. He gave him this amount of money for his, every. He does not. Basically, he doesn't see someone and think negative thoughts because of the race. This is the same thing with Jews. All these Jewish. He doesn't think like that. Right. About. So he says, I am. So this is the way he says it. Like, what are you talking about? Right. I, I don't. But. Right. And the response is, what do you mean that you, t- you know, it's, but think about I, mean, I, I, I won't go that far. I think he, I, I, no, I, I, I think, I think course, he, listen, I said what he said about the Mexican. That yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the most racist thing in the world. I'm just saying to think what he, of course, he's not right. Okay. But when he says it, what does he mean? You have to understand what, is he just crazy? So I mean, it's yeah, yeah. of the world. I don't want to defend him too much, but I, I do, I do want to, uh, I, I, cause I do think he is in some sense. Uh, a bit a bit crazy because you, you read this book Trump and like he didn't have any memory about things he would do because I think he's just such a narcissist and you know there was a valid thing in there about him you know making that statement about uh black people being lazy which I think was a valid uh thing but you know to to the point that we're making though it's like you can believe all those things and still think that a lot of the stuff, you know, a lot of the, yeah. the interpretations I, 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 are, are... I have no are, idea, whatever the evidence is about yeah. it, I have no idea how racist he is. I'm we're, just we're, saying, yeah, yeah, we're more focused, you know, what yeah. the thing I'd focus on is like the way people, no matter what they think of Trump, is the way they try to act as if like, well, clearly Trump voters must see the horrible things that I see about him too. That's the other very bad uh, yeah. conflict thing where people assume that like, because I think this person is horrible or whatever I think of them, then therefore I can judge these people. Whereas, whereas those people have a completely different view of the, of that person and just, just, you know, do not see if the, you the look, same if world. You, you know? If you look at the, the, which journalists are, are popular, they are the ones who are condemning and judging and the new, a moral, right. that gets a, attention. It's a yeah. moral crusade, yeah. right? And, and your side, you'd love moral crusades if someone is very good to indict the other side, right? But I mean, that's the end of the world, right? Because this is not what's really happening. But every day, it's like, oh my, this, you know, think about just as an example, Republican politicians and how they should behave towards Trump, right? So you have these journalists say, oh my God, this person, you know, if he doesn't do this, this has to, he has to, you have to, you have to think about their perspective, yeah, even if they don't like Trump, they're forced, whatever, right? right but there's nothing right. like that. It's yeah, deep. no, totally. No, that's hugely important, too, is like people interpreting, you know, Republicans not speaking up in like the worst possible ways. You know, it's like they must be fully on board with everything he's saying or the worst possible interpretations, whereas like there's much more mundane explanations in the same way you can imagine if there was like, you know, a Democrat who was doing extreme things like Democrats wouldn't want to talk about that because they wouldn't want to give points to you know, uh, to the other side and these kinds of things, and they also they some people some Republicans are presumably uh, waiting for you know kind of the madness to die down. They don't want to get involved in it. Maybe they're like it'll probably some of this will go away hopefully. Uh, so th- there's more generous interpretations. Because, right. of, so it's, yeah. this is important because they're about it's ideolog- They're about ideas and they match up human behavior and they oh you see. So when you think about people as people, you try to this you know figure them out yeah. different story right it's, it's yeah. so this is you know yeah. big problem and it's so oh, yeah for sure it's getting worse it seems yeah it seems like it's getting worse i don't know how we're gonna, i don't know how we're gonna survive but yeah, just I mean, that's right yeah the next I mean, year honestly i mean people think i'm very pessimistic but i'm like i do think like i don't think humanity will survive for like a couple more decades or three because you know we're gonna have bigger and bigger 
weapons. It seems like all the countries are becoming more polarized. You know, like the polarization to me is like the existential threat because we're going to have like people that can make man-made diseases in their basements and stuff, you know, this kind of stuff, you know? So I just think like people that act like, you know, this is some side, you know, side problem to me. It's like this failure of empathy and or, or how we behave in conflicts is like the main the main course to me. Because about... think about what the media is telling every U.S. citizen. Which side are you on? This yeah. is what they're presenting to every American. Whose side are you on? And you're, even if you start. So this is being presented that people they are not interested. They just want to bring home food for their family. No. Which side are you on? Are you going to vote for a president who did this? Right. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This this is this is a big problem. That was the second part of a talk that I had with Yakov Hirsch in November of 2023. One thing I meant to talk about in this talk, but didn't get around to, was something that I think is very important for understanding Trump's personality and the way he behaves. Trump simply doesn't want to do what other people want to tell him to do. If someone tells him you should do this or you must do this, he won't want to do it. I think that personality trait alone helps account for so many of the interactions he's had with the press and other people where people pressure him and he acts avoidant and stubborn. For people who'd like to understand Trump's personality, I highly recommend the 1991 book, Trumped, which was written by John O'Donnell. It's a very good book for understanding long-term personality aspects of Trump that go back to his Atlantic City casino days. For example, the book talks about his extremely poor memory, his narcissistic traits, his unreasonable fits of rage, his tendency to pit his underlings against each other to make them try to win his favor, and other things. It's just a very good and well-written book, and it was written by one of Trump's high-level casino executives. John O'Donnell said he wrote that book out of a desire to let other people know what Trump was really like. This has been the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zachary Elwood. You can learn more about it at peoplewhoreadpeople.com. If you'd like to learn more about American polarization, check out my site, american-anchor.com which includes information about my book and about my Substack newsletter. Thanks for listening.